behind us, right on the side of us. You can, you can kind of see the thing moving through the woods. Uh, all I can remember is flipping the light on, and I see this creature, and I knew, I knew in my heart, I knew in my mind, in the whole night, this isn't a man. And then this thing walks across the road, takes a turn towards us, and then leaps over a guardrail. Went to look forward, and there was a big black thing, is all I can Welcome to Squatch DTV, exploring the Bigfoot mystery each week with your hosts, veteran researcher, author, and TV personality, the Squatch Detective, Steve Culls, and from the Bigfoot Research Project of Kentucky, Chris Bennett. Sit back and buckle up as we bring you guests from around North America discussing the Bigfoot phenomena, but not without a few laughs, too. Here are your host, Steve and Chris. And good evening, cyberspace. Welcome to Squatch D TV for today's date, June 13th, 2021. I'm your host, your guide, the Squatch Detective Steve Coles, along with, well, that guy down there. Steve, what's happening, my man? He still has 10 fingers. Good to see everybody. <laughs> Good to see everybody here tonight. <laughs> now, that's a little inside joke, because Chris and I were talking about an implement that Chris bought, and he's afraid that uh, he's going to lose a finger. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a really cool little outfit. Yeah, I think, uh, it, although dangerous, it's, it's excitingly, you know, uh, provocative to use. Excitingly dangerous. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> as, long oh, as, you, as long as you don't lose that 11th appendage, you're going okay. Well, you know, that's the thing. <laughs> We trimming off some limbs and stuff, and this little handheld chainsaw. Those, those are, those are really cool. But oh my God, are they dangerous? And and you know, I don't know. We may talk about that product at some, at some time in the future, especially if I end up coming in with one finger missing. Well, we'll have a we'll have a Ralph Nader segment. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you don't want to buy yeah, it. Anything good, you know, they they take off the market because people tend to get hurt and injured with it. You know, like. I remember lawn darts. Uh, lawn darts were a cool thing oh, back yes. in the 70s. And, uh, and you know, now that I look back on, think about it, you know, kids with lawn darts throwing them, you know, that's probably not a good thing. So it might be a good idea that they took that off the market. I put one in my uncle's shed accidentally one time. Yeah, I, I did that. We had a little metal tool shed. Yeah. Uh, and I threw it up in the air and it came down and it stuck. And uh, boy, boy, I got in trouble for that. Man. <laughs> I remember that. Well, our guest tonight is Ray, and he is underneath Ray, Chris. Hello, Ray. Ray. Welcome. Hey. hey. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Oh, anytime, my brother. So our anyway, pleasure. we well, let's start with our roll call for the night. Of course, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's the, here? the first two in the house was, of course, OT. OT. And M and Chris. I'm and Chris. Welcome. And we got B Lynn. Hi, B. Good to see you, B. Yeah. Uh, Western New York Bigfoot Research Organization's in the house. 
Western. Welcome, uh, guys. Ken Collins. Hello, Ken. Hey, Amy Ken. Boo. She's in the house. Amy Boo. Good to see. Good She's see starting you. to do her thing again. Good Bob Lemley. You. Good to see you. Aaron hey, Mollenkamp. Hello. Aaron? Camp, low rider. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome, Aaron. Of course, we got, we got the infamous Michael Ann in the house. There he is with technical <laughs> big <laughs> Welcome, Tag. Good to see you, Mike. Walt is in the house. Welcome, Walt. Big Walt, little Walt. Something to Sasquatch about. <laughs> Welcome. And uh, hang on, we're, we're getting there. Uh, oh, my goodness. Golly. Blue Daxi's in the house. Blue Daxi. Welcome. Yeah. Former everything's back again. We must Former. be doing something right. <laughs> yeah. Well, Rod Dupree's in the house. Hey, Rod. We Good got Brian you. 49. Hello, Brian. Welcome. Hey, Brian. Welcome. David, welcome, Dave. Good to see you. Dave, good to see Terry you. Terry in the house as well. So hey, Terry. Uh, the house is filling up real fast. And uh by probably about quarter after, well, Mick will probably pop in with his meatloaf. <laughs> I wouldn't doubt it. <laughs> Oh, but, uh, so uh, a couple oh, of see Matt. Hey, Matt, welcome. Matt just come oh, yeah. in. Yeah, Matt just did. There he is. And uh, Brian and Chewy go hiking. He's back. Hello, Brian and Chewy. Yeah. And uh, and we got Jay, Jay and Jay Fritz. Hello, Matt's Jay. Got a welcome. Good video he just released too. A, a new video out. Uh, it's got the uh, mics in there too. So, okay, uh, hey, hey. everybody. Hang on. OT has a joke. Okay. What do we got? Why was OT, uh, why was Bigfoot fired from Foot Locker? Mm. <laughs> uh, for not wearing shoes. <laughs> wah, 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 wah. Okay, that's All terrible. Right. That's right, don't terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Working on that one. <laughs> uh, well, it makes sense. Yeah, it, it's really... <laughs> no. Wow. Oh, so anyway, <clears throat> many of you tonight will uh, see me with a cigarette in my hand as I, I usually do. But uh Chris, I you don't know this, but for the last week I've been taking Chantix. Ah, okay. And guess what tomorrow is? Uh tomorrow's the day you have to throw them away. That's <laughs> it. Tomorrow's my quick day. Uh, yeah. So uh, somebody asked me why why are you taking Chantix and just not quit? What does Chantix actually do? It, what it uh, does is it makes me less homicidal when I quit smoking. That's what it <laughs> 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 and, 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 and that's exactly what I said. And the whole room turned around and just looked at me like, uh oh. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a good thing. It it, it takes it, it weans your system off the nicotine where you don't get any benefits from it. So you're well, smoking no, what, what, what cigarette. It, what it does is good. is it lessens that part of the brain that says you need it. Mm. Um, so <coughs> you know, I tried it. Yep. Um, played hell with my stomach a little bit, but I'm starting to get over that. So, and that's a good thing. Um, but yeah, it, it's uh, I don't feel like I need one. Like uh, now, I think uh, it's just uh, it's just a uh, habit uh, thing. Yeah, so. a lot of that I think is psychological. Uh, you know, uh, Sherry oh. says I beg to differ. <laughs> nah, <I'm> Sherry. <laughs> and uh, Bob, good for you, brother. Good for you. Good and uh, I I had taken Chantix before, and I had quit for three years on it. So yeah. so. Uh, so I think it'll be okay. I, I think we'll be all right. Um, good job. Yeah, well, don't give me good job yet until I actually say, hey, yeah. I, I hang, in there. hang in there. Hang in there, yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> um, but the one other newsworthy note this week, uh, we don't have a product of the week, but that's not really newsworthy, is this little uh, event going on on June 26th in Kittle Falls, Washington. Next to Napa Auto. <laughs> um, oh. Apparently, um, a night with uh, my friend Yeti, Sasquatch event featuring Igor Burtsev. Now, I think Igor has uh, jumped the shark a little bit. Um, oh, and Ken's already asking a question. Have, I, have we actually interviewed anyone else from Ray's unit? Uh, not actually an interview, on, but I did manage to talk to him a little bit that one time, Ray. Remember, uh, yep. Um, and, Mike, and Mike has been able to 
Facebook message uh, another guy in my unit. Yep. Yep. So, um, but uh, but as far as uh, this uh, event's going on, if you note know the 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 run up after rescuing a yeti stuck in a bear trap, they befriended some of these hairy people and had communication and physical contact with them. Oh no. Um. <laughs> How come we hadn't heard about this on CNN? Yeah, you know, to me now you're you're jumping over that line to where you're hoaxing. Yeah, yeah. you're hoaxing, Igor. I'm sorry. That you sounds know. a little fishy. <laughs> yeah, you rescued a yeti stuck in a bear trap. Hmm. Oh, where's the trap at? Can we get DNA samples? He's gone the way of Janice. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, he lived with the Janice Carter for a little while, um, which uh, I don't know if it was just happenstance or what, but when they were doing a documentary about Bigfoot, and I don't remember which channel it was, they went and interviewed uh, Janice Carter, and uh, just so happened uh, Igor Burtsev was there. That <laughs> They showed up while he was there at the, at the farm staying with them, and uh, that's very telling. Uh, that was the one... Uh, I think that was the show where uh, Janice talked about uh, talked about the uh, the Bigfoot named Fox borrowed garlic. I think, uh, yeah. And there was a nice little illustration there of her holding a cup of garlic or whatever it was. <laughs> and uh, just so you know, uh, Brian, should we go hiking? Always great to hear from people who have served our country. Thank you for your service, sir. So, yeah. cool. and uh, so. Let's get into this. And Ray, uh, you know, the last time it's been a couple of years, we were on blog talk the last time. Now we're on StreamYard and we have a whole new audience here on YouTube and stuff. So there's a lot of people who haven't heard your story before. Um, so I'll just have you pick it up from the beginning and, you know, you know, talk about, you know, how you got in the service and just take it away because you're really good at that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, appreciate that. Uh, stories, typical. Um uh, had a little, every military story always starts with, well, the judge said, um, uh, yeah. in my case, it was not much different back in 1985. Um, the judge said military or juvenile detention. So, um, I did some bad things and, uh, uh, played around with some gunpowder and, uh, got myself in trouble and I had to work off a fine. And, you know, the typical back in the late 80s, uh, mid 80s, early 80s, um, I uh, got sent to, mil that's one of my favorite pictures, um, I got sent to uh, a, uh, 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 it's Military Academy, high school, and I went to Valley Forge Military Academy uh, to finish out my 11th and 12th grade, um, and it was just expected of us at that point to go in the military after being, you know, in the, in the military academy. Yeah. And so I, I did, um, love, uh, I love the military. Um, 1989 came about, uh, I got to go to ranger school. I graduated, um, class of eight of 89, uh, on May 17th, 1989. Those of you want to look at, look up the class picture. You can see, uh, our class. Um, back then, there's ranger schools because uh, the Cold War was in full bloom. The ranger, uh, the ranger schools were full. We started with over 200, and I gra think we graduated 100 and 112, 110, something like that. Uh, high attrition rate, nine week course back then. I think it's reduced to like five or six now, so it's a lot easier. And um, um, uh, Panama broke out, and I was injured. And uh, Operation Just Cause, and um, I wasn't uh, wasn't satisfied with the fact that I had to be medically discharged, and uh, I had an opportunity to take a spot as a uh, private military contractor for uh, Defense Intelligence Agency in South America. And on uh, July first of nineteen eighty nine, I or correction nineteen ninety, I entered. Uh, um, uh, South America stationed in uh, Otavalo, Ecuador, um, working the border of Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru, which is what we call the Coca Triangle. 
And uh, our job was to interdict um, the FARC, the famous FARC, and work with uh, the AUC, help develop them an army to counter them. And uh, um, from there, uh, I had a wonderful, uh, excellent time. I had been in South America several years prior. Most of my duty service was in South America. Central America in the early or mid 80s, um, uh, especially between the Contras and Sandinistas. In 1988, uh, those of you familiar with it, Operation Golden Pheasant, 1988, um, where airborne units took part in jumping into Honduras to give uh, uh, Daniel Ortega from uh, Nicaragua a show of force uh, that we were not going to let him and then uh, I worked with the Contras to uh, try to overthrow the Sandinista government and of course that you know how that ended up with the great big scandal and everything so and uh, after Panama Operation Just Cause and December 20th um, like I said I wasn't going to take just laying in a hospital bed and um, I got recruited uh, for Defense Intelligence Agency and uh Got volunteered to go back to South America. By this time, I was quite fluent in Spanish and still am. And um, uh, our job was to go in and basically uh, help DEA locate. And our mission was to destroy. Uh, back in the late 89 to the early 90s, they were starting to build submarines in the jungle uh, to transport uh, narcotics to the United States. Right. And uh, our job was to destroy those bases, find them, destroy them, uh, destroy the coca fields, and so forth. And um, um, yeah, it was it was it was hotter than Hades. Um, ah man, I mean, it's like being stuck in a wet blanket in an oven on broil yeah. the whole time in that Amazon. Yeah. And uh, so and that brings me up to what we're going to talk about today so well uh before we get started let me ask you something here uh gray if you can see the pictures that's flashing here yes one, that that one right there you're, you're holding a, a handgun yep uh and i see the background there uh was that it made in honduras i have a <laughs> because i have a, a recollection of a a place in uh, honduras where uh, it was like a temporary setup and it was just like two fours and ten and stuff set up and um, Kwanzaa uh, hut. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yep. Very cool. All right. But anyway, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> so you had been into you had been in. Yeah, you can see the cur you yeah. can see the curvature of the Kwanzaa there. Uh, yeah. This is in this is in Central America. Also, we were on the live fire range. Um, that picture, I believe, is. Uh, uh, me and an Ecuadorian soldier getting ready to do a high altitude jump. And this is, uh, I had one heck of a mess of comma wire. Um, <laughs> and they told me to straighten it out. <laughs> These yeah. are actual my army pictures yeah. from the uh, army. And of course, that's my uh, s service picture. When I went yeah. in, yeah, when I went in, they we still had the old uh, steel pot. And then we switched yeah. over to the Kevlar and the uh, flak jackets. Um, yeah. We still didn't have body armor back then, but... Yeah. You can't wear body armor in the jungle anyway. It's already hundred some degrees, and that was our standard loadout right there. Is get you know get typical uh, M17 gas mask, and uh, um, we had the front pouches for most ranger units and light infantry units carried the pouches up front yeah. um, uh, instead of the old mag pouches that you see in the older gear. Um, we got to get carry a little bit more modern modern stuff but uh when we switched over to dia uh of course we didn't use uh u.s weapons um we used the uh imbel uh made uh brazilian made uh fal yeah um, because it, yeah because they punched through the jungle where the 556 is so fast it just ricochets off trees oh yeah and yeah. uh so we everybody carried the 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 uh, 308 or 76251 yeah. yeah. uh, FAL and our, our we dropped the Breda M9 and went back to the 45 in the jungle also because yeah. um, the Amazon's so thick you can't even see 
more than five, 10 feet, you know, <laughs> in front of you uh, at any given time, especially at night, it's, you got limited vision. I mean, if you have night vision on, you're very lucky, but all you see is foliage. So even night vision becomes useless in the jungle at night. Um, you know, you have to rely on your human built in night vision and, uh, climatization. That's, that was the key. Yep. A lot of people don't realize that too. Night vision in, in dense, dense forest where doesn't really work very well because nope. everything is just like, you know, everything is glared up in front of you. So, yeah. And we didn't have at thermal was in its very infancy. Yep. Um, very, very infant. Uh, most, most the aircraft had it, but it was nothing that a, a soldier could carry. You know, even our, the, we had AMPVS five, um, which was the first set of goggles and they were pretty blurry. Um, yeah, but, uh, they just didn't work in the jungle. So we, 90%, we left them home. Yep. And, and, and I, I remember from the fire department, the, the thermal we had was like huge. Yeah. It's a big, Oh yes. Yeah. To, yep. And we, we'd call it the fire finder because we use it to locate the chimney fire in the wall. Yes. Right? So yep. yep. Um, Question from uh, Amy Boo, and uh, I know what you do, but what do you do now, Ray? So, I I am the milk shed manager for Maple Hill Creameries. I, I, I retired from being a milk inspector um, after 25 years, and I was offered a position for Maple Hill. It's the uh, U.S. largest grass-fed organic milk company, and uh, I manage all the milk comes from New York State. Uh, grass-fed organic farms and I am their farm quality specialist so I'm nothing more than a uh, bacteriologist um, specialized in the milk bacteriology and I'm a secondary degree in entomology so um, cool. yep to do a little bit of farm bug warfare it's pretty cool because <laughs> uh, on organics we can't spray for them so you have to use bug on bug warfare which is pretty cool, cool. Now, a question I have is, would you get fired if you became lactose intolerant? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I drink my fair share, trust me. Oh, man. It's all milk. Oh, I just, I, I had to ask that. That was just too, uh, you know, in a job like that and you became lactose intolerant, could you keep it? Mm, I, I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think so. Kind of uh, look at Bob. Bob's comment over there in the chat, Steve. <laughs> so, uh, Bob, Bob, Bob Lemley asks, so are you milking your job now, Ray? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm milking it. Boom, boom. I'm milking it. Hey, Bob Lemley, one OT zero. <laughs> I'm a joke score tonight. Oh, oh, man. That's pretty good, Bob. <clears throat> oh, hurt me. Boy, oh, boy. Okay, so let's get into the infamous Mopinguari stories. This is. So, uh, build us up. What was going on? What, you know? Okay, so on we we had ran several patrols in the. Uh, this is going to be north. If you look at a map, this is going to be north of the uh, uh, Putumayor River uh, that runs through Colombia on the border of Ecuador, and it's in three corner area of Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. Um, we were just north of that, not quite to Rocaforte. Um, there was an old Spanish mission out there, and uh, Peace Corps, along with the Catholic Charities and the LDS Family Charities, were running a uh, medical center out there, and our job was the FARC had come into that area, and they loved capturing uh, doctors, nuns, uh, missionaries, whatever, whatever have you, for uh, ransom, uh, thinking that they're going to get rich American people to pay for uh, a ransom if they capture them and of course sometimes if they didn't get what they want they usually killed sometimes they let them go sometimes they would you know kill them um and they targeted americans specifically uh including the british just about anybody it was uh you know against uh um you know really against uh uh the uh on you know, the, yeah, the the FARC worked for the cartel. There was there's no hidden secret. They worked for Juan Pablo Escobar, and uh, Juan uh, Juan Pablo controlled all of Medellin, 
And the Cali cartel, the Cartagena cartel, were pretty small in potatoes compared. And so the AUC was developed um, to be the anti-FARC uh, group, and we specifically trained them. And because being the white boys that we were from, I was from a north, born and raised in northern Pennsylvania, and uh, uh, most of my unit were were oddly were all farm boys, and uh, I don't think that was by mistake. I think that was because um, one, we could all shoot really well, um, and number two is that uh, you know we had natural ability to move through the woods, hunting, growing up hunting deer, and. Uh, uh, we had a, we had a couple city guys, but they were you know pretty decent, you know. And by this time, I, I'd already been in the service a good, I think it was my fifth, fifth or sixth year. Uh, I did a uh, little, almost four years active, and then switched over to DIA. And um, so everybody that worked for the DIA came from either Ranger Battalion, uh, SEAL Team, or you know they 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 collect the special special operators and uh uh because i was a jungle expert um i i didn't have a choice and if if everybody looks back at the time we were worried about the the big red star kicking in our doors coming up from the south and coming through our back door in alaska so the concentration of U.S. forces uh, when the Reagan era was in, uh, plus Reagan really, really pushed the anti-drug uh, um, yep. momentum in in South America, and it basically started with uh, the whole issue with Panama was that Noriega was funneling the drugs through uh, the cart for the cartels uh, using Panama, and uh, uh, he was. The best way to say it was a double agent. He was working for the United States and working for the cartels, and um, he made some big mistakes. And on December 9th, declared war against the United States. And so, uh, Bush Senior, um, Herbert W., um, uh, he decided that uh, George Herbert W. Bush decided that uh, on December 19th that. It was a go, and it was the largest airborne operation since World War II, and still has been. Now, uh, yeah. There has now, Ray, what, what, Panama actually declared war on the United States, and on the actually they declared war December 9th on the U.S. And then the harassment and the killing of the lieutenant took place before the actual invasion, starting on the 19th of December. Um, I was deployed 19th of December. Um, most of us came from Fort Bragg. Um, uh, quite a few of the Ranger units from Fort Benning, uh, 7th Infantry Division uh, from Fort Ord, California, which I don't think even exists anymore. Um, uh, but it was the uh, largest airborne drop, uh, approximately 16,000 parachuters. Um, wow. Uh, paratroopers. Wow. I mean, yeah. Panama declaring war on the United States is kind of like the little league team down the street declaring, you know, war on the New yeah. York Yankees. It's like, what the? Yeah. I mean, he, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what led up to all of it. There's a lot behind the scenes. There was a lot we weren't told. Um, but you know, we're good little soldiers. We do what we tell. We, we're, we do what we are told and we go take care of business. And that's exactly what we did. And, um, I was not gravely wounded. I was, uh, I, w I wouldn't say, my wife's laughing. Um, I was uh, injured enough that I had to spend quite a bit of time recovering, but uh, um, I did not, I did not want to leave the military. And of course the military is saying, no, you know, this is a disability case and uh, you are not any good to us. And, so while I was in the VA recovering, I was recruited by DIA and um, uh, mostly because of my ability to speak Spanish and that I was a jungle warfare instructor. And uh, I, had I had worked with the Ecuadorian Army before, so I was quite quite knowledgeable and going back there uh, was uh, my cup of tea. I, I, I literally begged for it. And that, that really was a bad place. Uh, oh, that was horrible. Also, because I have watched some documentaries 
uh, about the coca that they had going on, specifically with Pablo Escobar, this yes. one uh, large town that his uh, his compound was built just to the outside of it. I can't remember the name of the town. Uh, the number one employer for that area was Pablo Escobar. Yeah, so, most likely it was Medellin. Yeah, yeah, it would be scary, yeah. uh, you know, to have to look over your shoulder at all times, you know, about... Right, and we didn't trust the Colombian military or the police, so we, we could only trust the AUC, which was the... Uh, so the FARC was the left-wing fascist. Uh, they based their... Uh, it was basically an army for... Escobar, right. and the AUC was the paramilitary group that was sponsored by the United States to counter. Um, they were more the right wing and wanted Escobar removed. Escobar had a famous saying, if you ever watched anything on him, uh, he gave you a choice, either lead or silver. And if you didn't do what he wanted to do, he gave you the lead. Yeah. And if you did what he wanted to do, he bought you. Um, the AUC was comprised of just town folk, uh, people from Medellin, um, all around Colombia that just wanted to stop. And so the America invested lots of money, um, sent a team. Of, I was on the first team of 128 uh, that, um, that came down there. And I don't know if you have the picture of my South American team. It's uh, got the Spanish sign above it. Um, so if I can't find it, yeah, it has, uh, it says school of Insur insurgency, counter insurgency in Spanish, um, that picture, but, um, anyway, uh, I worked with a s exclusive team, uh, and the guides from the Quechua and Kofan and, uh, the, um, Kicho Kofan and the uh, Waronai tribes, they're called Iwawiwas, and um, they they were the ones that led us in the Amazon um, to try to find where these sub-bases were. Right. So, in all in all, we had a, a uh, report that subs were being built in an area, and uh, um, this uh, this uh, uh, I, I can't, it, I'll just call it a mission. Uh, this mission was in the middle of nowhere and it was in an old Jesuit mission that was probably built like in 1800s. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the uh, priest corps along with the uh, Catholic charities, there were several nuns there and um, several uh, uh, LDS missionaries that were nurses, etc. And um, they uh, um, wanted us to get them out of there. And we, we had to basically, we flew in as close as we could without them hearing helicopters. Uh, by this time in 1991, uh, the FARC had moved into northern Ecuador quite a bit. And it had taken over the western part of Peru uh, quite a bit too. And so they were gaining a lot of ground. And uh, everywhere we went, you know, we were running into them. And uh, they weren't the best shots in the world because there a lot of them were city kids that they just took off the, and I mean, they were kids. Uh, these are little kids, um, you know, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And then, of course, they had adults, but they weren't, they're were not military, military trained. Uh, not, you know, they're, yeah, not yeah, they're soldiers, right? You're right. They're par there was a paramilitary group. Um, the AUC was much more effective because at, at that time, our special forces and stuff like that were training them, including all the rest of us from the, the, what we call the famous trio of three-letter words, DIA, CIA, and DEA. Um, so uh, we were quite involved, and so they t asked us to go get these uh, doc Peace Corps doctors and these missionaries and uh, the nuns out of this area because uh, we did not want uh, a capture. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers, but back, I think it was 82, Eugene Hossenfuss was shot down 
by the Sandinistas and they captured him. And the U.S. military denied his existence, even though he was flying a U.S. C-130 uh, with weapons on board. Um, but military denied it. They didn't even know who he was. Um, and that was the way it was with our unit that uh, uh, we didn't we did not wear any uh, identifiers when we spoke on the radio. We spoke in Spanish. Um, uh, it was pretty confusing. To, and we made it that way on purpose. You know, uh, we didn't. Yeah. One of those yeah. deals where if you got caught, oh, he was just on acting on his own. We, we didn't have yeah, you, yeah. The government okay. would wash their hands like they did right. with uh, Hassenpus, yeah. who was also from Pennsylvania, and uh, several before me. Um, they just say, oh, you know, he he must have been a mercenary, and um, yeah. uh, then AUC would say yes, uh, they hired him, and blah blah blah, you know, and then return us to the states if we were set free, um, which didn't usually happen. Um, FARC were pretty nasty, but the cartel was even worse. Um, but one thing good about the cartel is they were, they were thugs. They did not have any knowledge of the jungle, they, uh, which in Spanish is called the Salva. Um, and uh, they didn't like venturing in there because that was not the territory. However, that was the FARC's back backyard so it's like me coming into your backyard i don't know where your backyard it, how your backyard's laid out and it's uh two billion acres yeah <laughs> two two billion <laughs> two billion heck acres of yeah. nothing but jungle and water and uh lots of deadly creatures besides two-legged and four-legged and non-legged um and uh so we were sent in to get this group out and um we arrived in the middle of the night, and um, my uh, my Kichwa name was Akikoete, um, which means the white ghost. And um, it was later changed to Hampe Amiuk, which I do have um, a certificate. And uh, I know Mike Ann's probably biting at the bit, said, oh, tell about you got lost. Oh, you got lost. Yes, I did get lost. Um, <laughs> yeah, I got yeah. lost. I got lost for 22 days, and I survived, and they actually gave me a award for it. So I got one day on all those people and naked and afraid. <laughs> and I and I didn't and I didn't have a camera crew or a medic crew with me. Yeah. It was me and the jungle, period. But you weren't so, naked. And I yes, I was not naked, but um You were afraid. Uh, well yes, I was afraid. <laughs> there afraid. was no doubt. I don't I don't think I could have handled being naked actually, but <laughs> uh you know, hindsight, I might have scared everything away. So um, maybe if I would have been naked, that, that would have worked, but <laughs> the mosquito oh, thing snickered. <laughs> that probably wouldn't have worked at that time, but, um, probably no, my luck, a monkey would have fell in love with me. I but, cannot imagine having to be out there alone, scratching to survive for 22 days. It, it, uh, it was crazy. It this, must have been quite the experience. Yeah. Go. I, I went, I had emotions of, uh, or a uh, uh, tidal wave of emotions up, down. Uh, I honestly com contemplated suicide. Um, I, the hope was that I just thought that uh, my team would come back. And it was a simple, uh, they, I was rear guard. Um, I was pulling rear guard. I had so many minutes to stay behind to make sure nobody was following us. And uh, when I took off, I got to a trailhead that had several different game trails. And we, we didn't carry radios because everybody had <laughs> listening devices to listen to where we were. They would listen to the chatter. And, you know, by it's, you know one stupid move, everybody knows where you're at. Yeah. And um, so... Um, Worst came to worse, I kind of played trail roulette. I just decided to take one trail, and um, yeah, 22 days later, I was found by a Waroni tribe, and uh, they had a shortwave radio, and um, um, I, I still to this day uh, don't know how um, I survived it, and it is a short story. Um, it, ha it has been printed. And, um, Good. yep. And, uh, 
it's a uh, uh, it's about twenty two page short short story and story story and then uh, what I did was I I kept notes uh, sort of a clipboard journal um, in case I was not found I wanted to let people know where I was what I did and according to the Wadroni tribe the tribesmen they had they'd saw me several times and I was just walking circles. So until my boy, you know, honestly, it was not my jungle training that saved my life. It was uh, boy scout training that said, you know, you, when you follow water, you start following it downstream. Eventually you're going to come to a village. And that's exactly yeah. what I did. Yeah. And took, but it took me several days to get my head on straight and uh, everything went wrong. that could go wrong. I mean, it just, um, I had one MRE for 22 days and I went through that the first day and then I lived off the land and I ate some stuff that I should have. And yeah, you know, it comes after that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> everything comes out of your body real quick. And, um, but the nice thing is you're surrounded by water. So that was, at least I, there was no way I was going to die of dehydration. Um, yeah, but that yeah. must have been scary. I mean, to think about, I mean, the, those jungles there, everything wants to kill you. There's insects yes. that'll kill yeah. you, snakes, yeah. leeches, you know, just. Yeah. Uh, the, my two biggest fears was the anaconda and the uh, the uh, jaguar. That was, the jaguar was probably my most feared. Um, the anacondas mostly stayed to heavy bodies of water because they're so big, they can't move on land. Right. Um, when they're on land, they're very vulnerable. Um, um, and I was right smack dab in the middle of the jungle until I found a small creek and small creek led to a bigger creek or the bigger creek led to a river. And I come right out into Waroni tribe. And I think they probably thought I was a mop and when I come up out of that water. Yeah. Um, cause 22 days, of you know, scum and filth and, uh, everything on me, uh, I must have looked horrible. I know they burned all my clothes, spent several days in the hospital trying to get rid of parasites. And uh, then they, I got sent home. And uh, I remember uh, my wife was told this many times by my family. And my sister still told the story that I sneeze and all the worms come out of my nose. Oh. And uh, it was that's how bad it was for several. I had bot flies I didn't even know about. Um Stuff swam in me, out me, up me. Uh, if it was open, it, it came in. And and then there was some stuff that I ate that ended up with intestinal parasites and oh. stuff like that. So um, not a fun time. But getting back to, uh, and this was happened before, so I kind of learned some lessons the hard way. And so on this mission, um, we, we had stopped. Uh, we mostly move at night because we learned the fart doesn't like the jungle at night and being almost all of us either being rangers or seals uh, then we own the night and um, so we moved at night and slept during the day and which made it very hard for the fart to find us and um, we had no idea where they were most of the villages had shortwave radios so if an indigenous village would see them they would call us Unless they were, they were considered friends of the FARC. And then uh, we kind of knew which ones were, which tribes weren't. So, you know, we tried to avoid those tribes as much as possible. Um, the Waroni uh, were very friendly. Um, uh, same with the Kofan, which I think they're, they're probably almost all gone. Um, excuse me. And then uh, the, the Kichwa just wanted... The, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, they just really wanted to, uh, get rid of the FARC in the, in the cartels. Yeah. Amy Boo has a question. Did sure. uh, you, the ex insects you experienced during the ordeal, did that have anything to do with you becoming an entomologist? Uh, yes, actually it did. Cause, uh, uh, I, I went back while I was in college, um, to make a visit and, uh, I, I come down with bot flies again. And, um, uh, while I was in college and, uh, I came back up, uh, we were, uh, Alfred state college was doing a program with the, uh, uh, a school in Honduras. And, um, I decided if any, which way I can get to central or South America, I was going to do it. And, uh, 
um, I had to go see the school for myself. And then I got a couple days. I went down into uh, Ecuador. And uh, while I was in the uh, Amazon basin there, I ended up with a bunch of bot flies. And um, uh, they, uh, yeah, I came back and I was in uh, St. James at uh, Hornell, New York. And they had never seen a bot fly before. And uh, I can kind of imagine they thought an alien was coming out of me. Yeah, um, yeah. For the people that don't know exactly what a bot fly infection consists of, Ray, could you explain it a little <coughs> bit? Uh, it has to do, it doesn't have to do with the fly really at first. Just has That's to do right. With the mosquito. <laughs> yeah. So the mosquito lays its larva on the fly. The fly or the vice versa. The, yeah. mis the fly lays the larva on the mosquito. The mosquito bites you and drops the larva inside the bite hole. And then the little bugger starts to grow. And they have backward-facing tentacles or, or claws. And as it grows, it eats your skin to live on. And if I can, I probably can. If you can see, I don't know if, uh, if you can see the scar... That oh, is yeah. a yeah, yeah. That, oh, yeah. That's that is a bot fly scar. That's oh, yeah. how big. That's how big they get. Um, that's one of several I have. That was one on my arm, and I had several on my head uh, that I still have um, scars on. That I could actually feel them in there, munching, oh, yeah. and um, so uh, quite there a was a thing I can imagine. Oh, it's it's disgusting. And so what they do is put Vaseline or petroleum jelly over top of it so it can't breathe. And when it comes out to take a breath, they pull. And it it's backward-facing claws. So they attempt, the larva attempts, yeah, it just oh, yeah. holds on for dear life. Right. And um, when they pulled them out and put them on a tray, I remember there was a nurse uh, in there uh, that she darn near passed out. Probably, um, yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, the one that was in my arm was huge. The one that was in the back of my neck was gigantic. Um, and at night I could hear it and I didn't know, um, I had recaught them, but yes, when I got lost, I had more than, uh, when I came back from when I was in Alfred state, I only had, I had four. Yeah, I think it was four. Um, when I was lost, I had, uh, I bet you I had a hundred. Wow. Um, and um, and then I was chewed up by everything from uh, there's a black there's a thing called black palm. Oh man, that it's a tree. It's a palm tree, and it it has venom in the uh, the uh, its leaves, and it, they're like a it's like a giant pricker bush. Um, when I mean giant, they're about five eight inch long stem stickers, yeah. and they'll go straight through you. And then to give you, it's like buckthorn out here. Um, after it gives you the nice jab, that leaves a little present for you that just burns and burns. And then there was uh, uh, the bullet ant. Um, that was one that, uh, yeah, found out when I got when I got bit by that thing. It feels like they call it the bullet ant because it you'd rather be shot. And um, yeah, That's the so ones I'm with a big pinchers in there yes okay okay yeah, yeah and then they they squirt a chemical in it after they bite you oh, so that, it's a type of acid and yeah. so not only do you get the the giant pinch he buries his head in there yeah. and then when he lets go he lets you have a little bit of acid um to remember him by and it is uh there's been claims of of uh indigenous people cutting their hands off and arms off uh, because it's so painful, um, it, very, very extremely painful. Hey, that that kind of makes me wonder. You know, with all the bad stuff that's out there in the jungle, one can't help but wonder how in the world do these indigenous people get by? You know, uh, how do they keep from getting eat up with bot fly larvae and stuff all the time? And you, that is a really good question. And and uh, we learned that they have a cure for everything. In the in in the jungle, in the Amazon basin, there's a plant or maybe another animal that cures everything, and it would be amazing. You would have them almost to a migraine, and you chew a piece of this bark, 
and is gone in seconds. Um, uh, that's that's the way these uh, they have knowledge that was back from the Incas to the Chimu, um, which were around in the time of Christ. I mean these these are thousands of years oh. going back. Right. Yes, right. that's there's one coming out right there. <laughs> no. <laughs> that's a little guy. Turn that's off, little. Wow. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, it's it's. Yeah. Can you imagine and that, having those dudes crunching on you, Steve? I, I can't imagine. Them. And you can hear it, you know, especially when right. they're against the bone, you can hear it. You know, they're 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 feeding regularly. That's how they continue to grow is right. they eat your tissue. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, so long story short, um, uh, we w come in the middle of the night to get this group out. And oh, um, yeah. <laughs> some of the pictures that, that I just looked up bot oh. flies. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. You know, yep. I, there, there was a bot fly about yay long coming out of somebody's head. Right. Yep. I had in the back oh. of my neck, so they had a lot of meat right. to work with. Oh, good. And, right. you know, they just, if you don't know they're there. Um, Bob, uh, Bob, Bob Lemley said, how are, how are you still alive? Oh, Bob! It's uh, the story gets better. <laughs> so I, 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 I think I'm. Uh, I, I must have a cat in me someplace because um, after getting wounded in Panama, I didn't think uh, uh, it could get any worse. But uh, my my career my career was ended by a 11 year old FARC soldier, and um, he shot me straight through and through. Um, I stepped on him on the trail uh, uh, about two years after um, my encounter, my first encounter. Um, but that's a story for another day. Um, um, but yes, I I was shot two different times, um, once in Panama and then again in uh, South America. And uh, uh, I, I, by the grace of God, I'm here. Um, and, and okay, OT just even the score. <laughs> Oh yeah, he just says, so the jungle of Ecuador is the best place to send the ex mother in law. Got it? <laughs> yes, I would agree. Yeah, actually, actually, that three that three corner area would be the best place because there's nothing there. Nobody yeah. will find them. So this this is the famous area that uh, uh, the explorer Hiram Begum uh, came up missing, uh, looking for El Dorado in the uh, in the peruvian part of this jungle um so in the three quarters area so the first night we came into a uh uh our what we do is we do what what's called acclimatize to the the adapt to the amazon after we insert um we spend about three four hours just sitting in place and let the jungle calm right back down again yeah and uh, while calming down, um, they, uh, uh, you, you hear everything. And, uh, we had, we'd gotten up the move and we had probably moved about 12 miles and came to a secondary spot. Uh, it was probably about two o'clock in the morning and, uh, we were get, we got in our, our tight 360 and, uh, uh, we always send, uh, two guards up. Uh, north and south of your position up in the trees to watch um, anything come, you know, if they can hear anything coming before, uh, you know, they have, you know, a little bit higher advantage to hear anything on the ground. Right. And if you think the jungle's quiet at night, it, it's more active in the night than it is daytime because most things are nocturnal. You hear everything from the roar of the jaguar to uh, 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 monkeys just going crazy, and uh, the monkeys, the uh, because as you move, they they don't know what you are. And uh, the reason why I wanted to see if you had that picture is let me see if I can pull it up and I can show it. Um, is because this is what we look like, and when. Uh, it kind of will explain a little bit of why there was some confusion, I think, to um, our sighting. Um, so we got to uh, get to there it is. 
See and Aaron, Aaron the, there is a Bigfoot story in here somewhere. Or it's coming. Right. It's coming. It's but coming. I, I, think it's very, I think it's very important to qualify the witness who he is. So well done. <laughs> yeah, and the, the, the reason why I wanted to show this picture is to understand right. that uh, what, what, now, what the Mopaguari was seeing. Right. If you hit um, your, if you pull that up on your screen, Ray, and you hit the share button on okay. the bottom of your control panel, there it'll say share the picture. Okay. Um, you can you can share screen it or you can, uh, uh yeah. The meatloaf. Uh -oh. <laughs> oh, that's uh, true. I lost you there for a minute. Hold on oh, a second. Yeah. Yep, the meatloaf joke, oh. which uh, Mick said. Somehow, I think my ex's mother, my ex's mother's meatloaf, would kill every indigenous creature in Ecuador. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I guess you could rub some of that meatloaf on the bot fly, you know, bites, and it might might take care of the larvae. I don't. Perhaps know. if you ate them, perhaps if you ate the meatloaf, the bot flies wouldn't even touch you. They would lack it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, my share thing is not working, so I'm going to try it this way. Um, <laughs> Uh, let's see if we can get this in the right position here. Uh, da, 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 da. There, you go. It, uh, there we go. Hang on. Yeah. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try to put it. Hang on. We're, we're getting. Uh, there we go. Nope. I'm trying to drag this like. Uh, there we go. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let me get out so you can see it. The whole picture. Let me uh yeah, go a long way. Shift, shift it to the right, actually. Yeah, That's there we go. Right. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Now everything's backwards with cameras. Yep. There we go. All right, let me get it straight. There we go. So this is what we look like when we go to the jungle. Um, this is exactly and if you can see the Spanish sign up there that says the school, uh, Salva's Jungle. So this is a jungle warfare school, school of insurgency. This is where we taught the AUC how to fight. And I am in the picture. I am weapon number nine, which I don't think we're going to be able to see. But if I can zoom in on uh, weapon nine, if I can find it. Uh, anyway, I'm in there. Um I think right there is weapon. There you are, right, right, yep. right. Yeah, yep. right there. Uh, to the very far up, oh, you're going off yourself a little bit. There you are, right there. You can see the zero nine on your weapon. Yes. Now you can tell the Americans um, we have the bright numbers on our rifles. Yep. So if you scan over all the rifles, you can see the bright number ones are Americans, and then the indigenous or uh, natives are wearing the. Uh, the uh, light colored numbers. And so this is the reason why I show this picture is if you look at our faces and our, our equipment, um, we are completely camouflaged like you wouldn't believe. Right. Uh, so as we moved about uh, 12 miles, uh, we came to a resting spot. Um, uh, this is where first, first incident happened. Um, we had the typical, uh, uh, our uh, higher sentries, Notice there was movement and uh, alerted us to movement um, off to our left. Um, and uh, which, if I was, if we were facing the correct way, it would have been to our our northwest. And uh, they alerted us to movement and uh, a, a very similar to what some report here uh, in the United States is rock throwing incidences. Uh, we started getting rocks thrown at us and stuff like that. Uh, uh, then uh, the first howl was heard. And the only howl I ever heard that was like it was one from Michigan um, that uh, Mike, Ann, Mike Ann had, uh, uh, I, I actually, I believe it was uh, uh, you and Mike Ann had at the uh, Rochester Prairie Fest different howls and it was one that was very similar to one that was found in Michigan and that was the howl that I remember and uh, it gave a big howl and nothing 
Uh, we moved approximately 15 more miles uh, heading northwest into Colombia and scooting the, along the border of Peru. And we had stopped again. Uh, this is probably now about just before sunup. And I have to remind everybody, when the sun comes up in the jungle, you don't know it. Um, it is dark all the time. Uh, the sun doesn't penetrate the jungle canopy. It gets light enough that you could probably see 50, 75 yards at the most, but uh, very, very limited. Um, this is probably, I'd, I would say, guesstimate about 5.30 in the morning. Uh, sun's not quite up over the mountains. Um, we're below sea level in the jungle. The Andes are, are to our west. And so the sun has, you know, sun, uh, and to the east is the, uh, um, uh, the Sierra, I can't remember, Sierra Esmeralda mountain range, I believe it is, but it has a, sun has a long time before it comes up to get into the jungle valley. Right. And, um, uh, we had been notified of our, uh, LPOP, which is the listing post observation post that we had again movement to our northwest coming at us. And uh, we prepared for a, we pre got ready and prepared for a fight. And um, um, at this point, we didn't hear any noise. Uh, it got real quiet. And it was very interesting because, like I said, all the monkeys stopped. All, every it was like every bug insect everything just stopped mm -hmm. and i don't know who saw it first i think it was one of the iwa iwas um said and this is the first time i'd ever heard the word mapanguari and he said i think the mapanguari's here and we really thought they were joking with us. Okay, this is a good way to scare scare us white boys. You know, ha ha, jokes on us. Yeah. You know, because even even before all this, I I was never a believer, never. Um, and uh, and also several people had told us that the his story of the Mapanguari is it's nothing more than a giant sloth. Um, throughout South America and Cliff and Bobo from the uh, Bigfoot show found this when they were down there that several tribes have different uh, different uh, uh, ideas of what the Mapanguari is. I think right. it's a general name. It is an indigenous name. Um, but what we saw, it was not, it was a humanoid. It was a Sasquatch type humanoid. Um, I'm going to say uh, my my guesstimates were of approximately nine to eleven. I'd say right around nine feet, maybe eleven. But it was hard to tell because he come up to a side of a tree and was leaning over the side of the tree, trying to figure out what we were. Now you're saying, well, well, he had to know you were human. No, because you remember we were all in tiger stripes with matching tiger stripe face face paint in the pitch black. Right. Not one of us trained a rifle on him. Um, I was approximately 20, about 24, 26 yards from him. And I turned on my red lens flashlight, and that's when we saw the eye shine. We saw red eye shine because we had red lenses in. I don't know the color of his real eyes because we were using red lens flashlights. And like I said, we didn't know this until after the fact. Uh, in fact, I think it was you, Steve, that brought up the fact that it was probably red because we had red lenses. Um, right, right, right. Um, but we had a, a, a picture of an outline, and we could see the reddish-brown, like uh, almost a orangutan color, and uh, much bigger than a human being. And he let out a roar that just went straight through us and shook me to the core. And the Iwa Iwas disappeared. They they took off on us oh. and just left us right there. And this thing was, he was leaning back and forth trying to figure out what we were. And it's amazing because we were heavily armed. Um, most of us carried 200 and 
about I think 220 rounds of man, ammunition wow. in those big in those big uh, FALs and yeah. yeah it was it was just too human for us to even consider taking a pop at it and we just were in shock because I don't think anybody knew what we were really I, I mean I we thought okay is somebody in a gorilla suit you know what is going on here is this are we being punked in the middle of the jungle you know what's yeah. going on and he took off and got i'd say about yes that's the picture there it is there um, you are right there <laughs> yep there i am yep and you'll notice all the bright white numbers are all americans so you can see yeah. clearly see that uh that we are uh look much different than uh, of course i'm a short guy so i blended right in but um uh that was the team that was with me that night um and uh uh chris uh, Chris Harrington is over to, it would be my, my right facing the pitcher. So it'd be your left. Um, he's one of the guys that was with me and, uh, that Mike, Mike Ann has spoke to, um, everybody else just kind of didn't know what the heck we were seeing. Uh, we, we were just shocked. Absolutely shocked. It got, uh, I'd say maybe. 100, 150 yards away from us and gave out one big war hoop again. Uh, the long, drawn-out howl. And uh, we were all like, well, what the heck was that? And uh, uh, about it took the – it was about 30 minutes to come back. And they were shaken to the core. And all they kept saying to us, "You, Mapanguari, Mapanguari, this is – we're in his territory. I'm like, okay, all right, sure we are. I, I, so my first thought was this is a, a gorilla or, you know, something that big that they didn't tell us about when we started the jungle uh, creatures of the forest. Um, yeah. uh, because, you know, they're, howler monkeys are big, but they're not that big and they're not that color. Howler monkeys are black. Right. Um, this was uh, the definitely the uh, reddish orange fur, and the only reason why we tell it because uh, I said just minimal light just started coming in at this time. Uh, we went two or three more days. We got to the uh, the monastery or the old uh, mission, and uh, we gathered our crew and was heading back, and we were talking amongst ourselves about this, and. Uh, the one of the uh, Peace Corps doctors said um, that explained something, and I said, "What it was explained was uh, if when on our way out, he said uh, he's going to take us to a, a mission that was built in the early or late 1700s, early 1800s, that uh, all the religious artifacts were destroyed in it, but something was living there, and when we got to that." Uh, uh, we got to the uh, this mission. It was dilapidated. There was no no all the roofing was gone. All the timber had rotted away, but the uh, adobe brick was still there. And um, clearly, something was using this for residency. And you just get this feeling that you've been you're being watched the whole time. And through our retreat back into Ecuador, um, we were approximately 20, 22 miles from the Ecuadorian border. Um, just on the Ecuador or border of Peru and uh, Colombia when the second incident happened. And again, it showed itself. It, it did, uh, a came from the same direction, but we're opposite now because we had returned back. And we, as, as a ranger, we never, one of the ranger's rules is you never take the same trail you, you went to, you never take the same trail back. Right. So we were on a completely different trail. Um, so they, we can't be tracked. And there's always a rear guard that covers our trail. And the rear guard come up and says, something's following us. And we, it, it sounded big. So all of us assumed Jaguar immediately. And a Jaguar is something you just don't mess with. 300-pound um, cat. And, you know, you're just going to end up shooting each other if it comes into your camp, because there's just no way of getting around it. And, um, uh, rear guard come up and said that, uh, uh, we were being followed. 
he decimated it was a, a Jaguar. Uh, we went in defensive posture. Uh, we were laying on the ground. Again, you have to watch where you lay because there could be black palm. There could be a snake there waiting for you. Uh, there could be just vines or anything else or that could hurt you. So, I mean, you just don't plop to the ground. And we, we were worried that if it wasn't a Jaguar, that it was possibly far had picked up our trail and were coming after us. And so we readied ourselves, and somehow it got around. Uh, so we did a 180 and was ready to fight backwards and it had gotten around to the side of us and again, presented himself to us. And it, it just stood there and looked at us and the, I can't even, I can't even explain the feeling that you have because this is like, this is twice now you see something you cannot explain. You, your brain is telling you this is, it's, it's human. It's walking on two legs. It's not walking on four. It's walking on two. Um, this is bigger than anything you've ever seen in your life, including, you know, I've, I've been hunting in Alaska to, you know, the Alaskan brown bear, and I, I can't compare it to Alaskan brown bear. It, it was just massive. And once again, all the Iwis took off, and uh, there was one that was, uh, the chiefs are Yachatetas. The chief was saying, something in Quechua and like it was not there was talking to it, but like praying to it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he explained later that they're the guardians of the rainforest and that this was his territory. And he was upset that we are there. And, you know, to say that we are an uncharted area, like I said, this is the area that higher Bingham got lost in and was never found. Right. Um, so, I mean, uncharted only to the maps that we had and the correct, you know, if they were correct. Um, lots of times, uh, most people out there have to understand when the rainy season comes, the whole jungle floor changes. Um, and then when it dry, the dry season comes back in, it changes back. Not the exact way because the water may have changed the way the rivers flow, the creeks flow, way water s stays in certain areas where it retreats out right. so during the rainy season water can go, come up 25 to 35 feet and you completely have a different aspect of the jungle when during the dry season uh when you're walking on this um uh it, you, you may not you may think you know where you are but you're nowhere close and i need to remind everybody you are on the equator you're within uh, the 100-mile zone of the equator on both sides, compasses do not work. Um, they, If you're on the south side of the equator, they will spin counterclockwise. If on the north side of the equator, equator, they spin clockwise. The closer you get to the equator, the worse the, uh, the, worse the, uh, uh, the spin is. They're very unreliable. The magnetic field, you're actually on the equator, you're actually about 15 pounds lighter than what you are when you're standing right on the equator. The gravity pull is such that it's, uh, and I have on my pictures, um, a picture of us standing uh, eggs, pennies, everything on the equator, and they bounce, bounce straight up. And um, um, so we were, and actually we were above the equator, so um, we get the uh, clockwise rotation and, uh, you know, we tried to figure out where we were. We we're looking at their river markings, trying to find where we were. And we just knew we were north of the Putamahor River. And um, uh, it, again, I can't explain what we were seeing. And Ray, uh, it, Bob, Bob Lindley over in chat's got a, a good question. He said he wanted sure. to know did you smell anything when during the encounter? No, I, I, everybody's asked me that, and I did yeah. not get wind of it. I don't know whether we we're – I. it's it's hard to tell because, honestly, I don't think – everything in the jungle stinks. I mean, right. everything does. <laughs> uh, and after you cross through a few swamps, you stink so yeah. bad. 
it's i don't know whether you're smelling it or me you know yeah. i mean it's yeah. it's bad and you know like i said we had been out there uh it was a 25 day mission so this yeah. is uh, we stunk so and i can't the thing yeah about i can't that is too i mean uh if it uh it started out it was approaching your your unit from the rear and yep. then it, it kind of uh, did a flanking maneuver around yes. you. Yes. So it could have been working its way around to where it would be intentionally be downwind from you. So could have been. It, you, yep. it would smell you, but you wouldn't necessarily smell it if there was any breeze. Yeah, I'm sure we stunk, so I know it smelled us. <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, you know what you know you, you know what it's like. like a wild yetis. <laughs> yeah, I mean uh, you're you're in the jungle for twenty five days and oh, you're wearing oh, the oh. same t shirt. The same jungle shirt the whole time. You don't. You, the only thing we change is our socks. That's the only thing we change. Yeah. Um, and uh, keep them toes dry. <laughs> that's right. You know, and it's it's hard because you're wearing jungle boots and they got the vents on the side, so every bit of water goes in there, but it actually aids in drying your feet. You know, when you're on, uh, you know, the air movement, you know, drains the water out and you get air flow. But right. uh, I'm sure. At this point, now it knew that we were a threat because its behavior changed. Um, it was much more aggressive. It was more vocal. And uh, I can't say it was communicating with another one, but we did hear the typical tree knocks like you have with the North American Sasquatch. Now, I will admit I have never, ever seen a North American species. Mm -hmm. I pray someday that I do because I have a philosophy in my head um, and from what the Yachitetas told us down there that uh, they're very religious about it. So there's a there's a religious theory that the, the indigenous tribes have that these are the watchers of the rainforest uh, put there um, by the gods to watch over and protect the rainforest from those who do evil. Um, the Iwa Iwas claim they have never had anyone ever attacked, but the FARC that we had talked to and interviewed many times that were captured would report that they would have their camps destroyed and, uh, attacked by these things. And, and you know, that uh, seems to be a common theme too, right? Around the world. Um, uh, uh, anytime there's indigenous people and they have these creatures around, yes. They, they they take on some sort of uh, religious or a, a yes know, yeah. like a, a protector of the nature uh, role. Well, yep. and, and, uh, and you got to understand that that you know you know the Native Americans did the same thing with Sasquatch. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So and, not surprising, and it's not surprising too that Vark would say that their camps had been destroyed. Uh, you know, I remember years ago being told a story up on the Navajo reservation. Uh, by one of their uh, fishing game rangers saying, yeah, a, a couple of winters ago, I got called up to a, a hill because they wanted me to pick up their camp. And he went up to their camp and it had been tossed. And he, he goes in the snow, you could see all these, you know, barefoot tracks, you know, but they were large. And mm -hmm. uh, so it made all, all the sense that I think that's a common thing. It may not be something destructive as more of a curiosity thing. Like, hey, what's this? Nobody's here. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, so the only difference that we noticed with uh, now that uh, and I and I, I really got to give Mike Cam because he really got me into this out here in North in the North America. Um, I live in a very rural area that has had numerous reports. Um, uh, his wife family comes from my area. Um, and so uh, I've watched a lot a lot on TV trying to learn more about the Sasquatch and try to compare it to Mapanguari because I had two actual physical sightings that lasted more than just a few seconds. These were stay there and watch us for several, several minutes trying to figure out what we were and if we were a danger. And everybody has ever asked me, why didn't you just shoot it? And it's too human. It's just, it's just too human. You can't, you can't, it's, I don't think any of us ever thought about doing this. And like I said, you know, I don't, do I know where uh, some of these indigenous people that, or some of these uh, uh, 
uh, Iwa Iwas are today. No, I don't. Uh, I do have contact with two, and Craig is still an active uh, operator, so uh, Craig gets the chance every once in a while to verify my story to other people. Um, and uh, I think uh, it's fair to mention, too, Ray, that when you're on a, an operation of this sort, uh, you, you have a, a certain <laughs> certain designation or certain um, – plan yeah. you have to follow by you're not there just to shoot up the wildlife <laughs> right and we you equate that if you pull the trigger somebody knows where you are now exactly you know yeah. yep and same with building a fire you just can't just right. build a fire in the middle of the jungle because yeah. everybody will know where you are and uh, same that that's why we use uh, red lenses because the light only travels a certain distance right. you and with the foliage you really can't at the same time, if I think if I would have had night vision goggles, I probably would have got a better look at it. But it just seemed to know it would climb a little higher to look over us and not, you know, it not at eye level. I'm trying to, and we also noticed that several shows here show a three knock uh, system up here. Uh, it would only do two knocks in South America. It, and but they were spread out a little it, knock knock and then nothing and if you you know we're not out there thinking i'm going to talk to this thing uh, i mean you know i look back now i wish i could have communicated with it i wish i would have said something to it i was i was pissing my pants i mean i'm just being honest i mean i was scared to death I didn't know. I'm sure if I saw a Sasquatch that was much bigger out here, I would do the same thing. Um, but being in a foreign country, we just assumed it was something they didn't tell us about. When we got back, uh, we did not we did not run to our our command structure and say, hey, I think we just had a South American Bigfoot expedition. Yeah. No, that's not something you do. You know, we kind of said, and then the Iwa the Iwa say, you don't say anything about it unless you want it to become your enemy. And there was a lot of, like I said, they claim they can read minds. You know, we, we were told everything. I mean, yeah. mm -hmm. you don't know what's true. You don't know what's not because, but the, 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 Indigenous tribes, especially the Woroni, which are more of the, uh, they still they still use the blowguns, everything. Uh, they told us, you know, in as my next year, I spent talking to many Yachatetas in Waroni villages, asking about the Mapanguari, and you know, they would say, okay, this is how we say it. Um, in Brazil, it's Mapanguari. Mapanguari, 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 you know, it, it just depends on where you were. But the cons general consensus was that it is not, and I can tell you from what I saw, it is not a giant sloth. It is a humanoid. Now, there's claims in Manaus, Brazil, that they have seen giant sloths. Um, I can tell you that uh, they claim that the uh, super the the giant anaconda is extinct. It is not extinct. We actually saw several um, in the uh, plus 30 foot range. Mm. Um, the biggest one we saw was from the air. Um, that was a guesstimate of, uh, I'd, I'd say probably 44, 45 feet. And then when we got to the museum in Cusco, Peru, they actually have uh, the uh, one they found in a mine uh, that's 84 feet long. Um, so if, and, and also for all the viewers out there listening, you have to remember every day they find a new species of critter, bird, mammal, or something every day. Even primates. by the number, yeah, even primates yeah. every day in the Amazon it is so dense and vast that you know 22 birds in one day they never even knew existed um there's still fish being pulled out of the amazon they didn't even know existed um so is there something out there is it related to the north american species i can only go by what 
I watch on television. And, you know, I know some of the shows are, are BS. Um, but there's, you li- you can listen to some of the reports and just know, um, uh, like I was listening to Mike Ann's interview uh, about the rock throwing incident and y- you, you know, he doesn't know all the story of what we experienced. There's so much similarity there. It's very scary. Right. Um, and I just can't, there, it's something I just still well, cannot be- explain. Even their behavior with knocking, you know, tree knocking, yes. um, the the kind of standoffish watching, the observational thing. Yes. Um, yeah, there's a, there are a couple of questions. <laughs> my, sure. my, Mike earlier had asked, there, there's not a mouth in that stomach, right? Like, like no. Some of the, <laughs> yeah. 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 So some of those there's, depictions. Yeah. yeah, there's been depictions that the uh, some of the uh, uh, indigenous people have drawn that there's a mouth on it. Now, there is a white section of belly. That uh, they have a white spot in the belly that I can see with somebody drinking a lot of chicha would probably say that's a mouth. <laughs> um, yeah. Chicha is their alcohol drink. It's made from uh, fermented maca juice that is chewed by the women of the village and spit in a jar oh. and then buried. Oh. And it ferments. And when you drink it, it's like moonshine. You don't get oh. to stand up after oh, you drink no. it. Cool. And it is nasty. And <laughs> yeah. Uh, and. Uh, I'll pass. <laughs> yeah. So they, they chew maca root and the, all the women in the village, the whole tribe, the, all the women will spit into the juice, the juice into the, it's a purple juice. Okay. And uh, they spit it in a jar. They will bury it underground for six, eight months. And then they bring it back up and drink it. And the alcohol content is unbelievable. Uh, I, so I can imagine they can see some, uh, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they'd seen UFOs come down and duct them. I mean, uh, well, uh, between right, that and human coca leaves. Yeah. yeah, so then you throw coke in on top of it, you really yeah. got a big, you got a really big problem there. I, I never <laughs> realized uh, what uh, how how rampant that is. Uh, there's a YouTube channel. I forget the name of it. Uh, uh, it's this guy, he's from England and he goes all over and he lives on very low cost and he travels all over and he went to Central America and like every other person was chewing coca leaves. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, yeah. They usually dry it, uh, yeah. to chew it. They dry it to a, the brown or black form. And then, uh, um, you put it in and chew it like, uh, chewing tobacco. And, yeah. um, yeah, but it gives you the one wicked, uh, um, the, uh, the, so the, the key word or there's two there's three tribes uh two two types of quichua the mountain quichua and the lowland quichua of of ecuador and then the mountain quechua of peru and they the mountain quichua and the mountain quechua both use uh dry coca leaf to help breathe at 16 18,000 feet and because it does open up all your vessels and uh um um and i yeah yeah, it, it yeah, it yeah, definitely actually OT, it will definitely help. OT just said, yeah, coca leaves are sold in gas stations. It's like great for keeping away altitude sickness. Yep. Yes. Yes. That was, that was as you were saying that, and they're a few minutes behind us, so or about a minute behind us. The chat's always, you know, so they're yeah. Um, wow. Ugh. So here's the thing. <laughs> uh, well, here here's some questions I have. Now, sure. you, you said it, it looked human-like. Now, is that because um, it, it stood upright? I mean, did it have a neck, or was the, the shoulders kind of into the neck? Or Very broad shoulders. Um, I Not like you and, like, I mean, more like my neck. It's like a basketball sitting on top of a shoulder. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm a big guy, so... Uh, at two, you know, at, at two fifty eight, I'm I'm a pretty big guy, but uh, br- very broad shoulders, and then more, uh, you know, more of uh, uh, a, ne- a kind of a a head just sitting there. Um, the head is quite large. Um, now on the, I don't know, like I said, I've never seen a North American Sasquatch. On the South American version. Uh, from what I could tell, when he had his hands wrapped around the tree, they have a claw-like structure. Um, it's very... Uh, I had an artist rendering of it. I know I shared it with Mike and, but uh, a lady 
drew one for me. Uh, and um, I don't know whether I could pull it up. I, it might be able to find it in my, I think I left it my favorites. Um, she actually drew a picture. Um, she was a forensics drawer for the Colombian military. And um, I became fascinated after this sighting um, for obvious reasons. Right. And um, um, I, I just, I wanted to know more. I just, I wanted to know more. And I just could not figure out what I saw, why I saw it, why it showed us why it didn't attack us, why it it just made its presence known, and that's it. I mean, that's as much as I can say that happened to us. It it was not it was aggressive in its own right because, as the Yachetedas told us, we were in its territory, and that's that's all I can say. I mean, I don't, um, I'll, I'll leave it to the non-believer. Um, but you know, the nice thing is that there were several witnesses of it. And, um, you know, I, I, I thought I was crazy at first. I really did. Uh, I just couldn't believe that, um, any, that I saw anything like this. Um, so you, you get back, and, and what do you guys say amongst yourself about that whole thing? I mean, We what? agreed to keep it quiet for quite a while, especially to um, the DEA, CIA people. Right, um, right. Um, and Because they probably once, don't think you were chewing the coca leaves. Yes, yes, and I'm sure that, oh, yeah, there it is. Um, so this is the, an artist rendition, um, and you can see it doesn't have a, uh, it doesn't have a, uh, let me get it in position here. Oh, there we go. Hang on, I try to get you. All right, there we go. I'm gonna go this way and back. Oh. All right. There's about what man, everything's backwards on this. There we go. If I turn it right way now, keep it going. Now, did oh, it seem to have long claws like that, or was yes, that? yes, that was. This is my. Uh, I described to her what I saw, and she. She draw. She drew pretty much what. Uh, the arm was positioned on a upper branch like this. Uh, however, his right arm was also wrapped around the front, and that's why I got a good look at the. Uh, um, very good look at the. Uh, um. Uh, the whole body structure. Um, and like I said, I was about 20, 22 yards from it. Uh, the first time, the second time was, I was, I was probably a little bit closer, um, a lot closer than I wanted to be. Um, wow. We assumed it was a female because I did not see a penis. Um, not that I wanted to see it. I wasn't looking for one, but. <laughs> now, um, some, somebody asked a question. And yes. Somebody was saying, saying, wow, so, super long claw is interesting. Now, here's my, my point is, could they just be long extended fingernails? Could be. Yep. You know what happens when we don't trim our fingernails. Right. And that's yep. what people don't understand is, is that uh, chimps, gorillas, orangs, they all chew their nails to keep that's them right. down to that's size. Right. Yep. Maybe there is some advantage of digging or perhaps the jungle forest actually having longer nails to kind of scrape up the bottom floor. Yes. To look yeah. for food. So yeah. that may be just a, an adaptation that they don't trim their nails to do that. Yeah. Um, so, um, so and you can see the white center in the middle. That's where a lot of people said it has a mouth. It is. No, it's a, it's a, a white spot in their belly. Now the, this is about the size that was about, the size of the one um, in there and the way the hair lays um, it just I can see where somebody that saw it quickly would assume that be another mouth area but like I said we had a, quite a bit of time to look at it and uh, try to figure you know at, honestly at first we thought it was one of those guys in a ghillie suit that was just trying to live it scared the living bejesus out of us right. um, uh, but the the motion, the act, the the actuation of the body and everything did not make. It was more uh, primate than what a human could do. Right. 
Right. Um, and also the, the the one thing to note is when it turned its head, its shoulders moved with the head. So right. it wasn't that it wasn't like you know it was like we can do this. Okay. It would it would turn its body uh, to look. Gotcha. Yeah, that's interesting too. Uh, you know the comments about the the giant sloth. Uh, that would be interesting if if you had stumbled upon an extinct uh, thought to be extinct creature. Uh, but but uh, the thing is, if it had been a sloth, he would have been really, really slow. Real slow, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So that kind of that kind of just you know. It yeah, when this thing the long nail. Yeah, when this thing took off on us, uh, it was it was the typical like the bound, boom, boom, and it was gone. Yeah. Yeah. So that kind of clears it clears it clears the way from the for the uh, away from the sloth theory. Because uh, we got something that's moving around at a pretty good pace like a primate would. Right. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. Yeah, that makes, uh, that makes uh, a world of sense, though. Everything seems to... Um, now, the, the face, uh, you know, and of course, it's an artist rendition. So, I mean, yeah. was there a jawline present? Was there, you know... Uh, I, could, I could see the mouth. I didn't... You know, and again, I wasn't looking exactly to try to figure out the jawline. Uh, the artist, when she drew it, is from my recollections, uh, you know, 20 some years ago. Um, uh, I just, uh, I remember when it gave the roar that uh, I remember seeing the open mouth. That's, wow. uh, I didn't see teeth. I didn't see, you know, it wasn't like a, like a baboon when they show the canines right. and yeah. stuff like that. It wasn't anything like that. It was, uh, I did see an open mouth, um, but we've we've had witnesses that have seen teeth of a Sasquatch, and they're very much like ours. They're square. yeah, yeah, I, that, and that's what I assumed is like uh, even when I smile, you don't I don't show my teeth. You know, I, um, I'm sure I'm not sure this thing smiles, but I mean, yeah. um, and have it was having those yeah. nails or claws or they to, to me they they're probably nails. They, you know, it seems like to me that they're probably you know, eating, you know, whatever yeah. insects and grubs. And I, I'm sure there's a, a, there's going to be some sort of advantage to having long nails where they're in the habitat yeah. that they're staying in. Yeah. yeah. And Mike, it, Mike this asked, is, it, did it sound like a howler monkey? No, not at all. No, no, that howler monkey, you know, they got that deep, um, you know, <clears throat> like that, you know, it, I've heard it so many times when I was trying to sleep that it's still agreeing to my brain. Uh, cause they just, they, they just don't let you sleep. Kind of like um, the whipper will. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, it, yeah, or me without my APAP. Um, <laughs> uh, but, uh, no, this was a, uh, after it got away from us on both sightings, it gave out the long drawn out, you know, the long drawn out moan. moan. Yeah. That's the best way I could say it. It never, it didn't grunt. Or anything when we was up to us uh it made no noise and it the how it even got up to, onto the tree is blew our minds because we didn't hear anything until it was actually rubbing on the bark and uh that's that's what caught us uh that we uh, all of us looked at the tree and you know there was some you know foul language coming out it's like what in the world is this and not exact you know, not exactly words. And all we heard was running of the Iwaiwas and they were yelling, Mapanguari, Mapanguari. Right. And, you know, that, and that was my first, when we got back, I talked to some of the other Spanish, uh, the, uh, the uh, soldiers in the Salva unit. And uh, she had talked to the, the artists that did this and talked to several of us and come up with a rendition. And this is pretty close. I mean, um, uh, Craig has the original, um, picture still. And, um, yeah, it looks um, like we, from the, from the picture, it looks like the, the body was, was fairly bulky rather than yes. something long and uh, long and lean. It was pretty bulky. Yeah. That, that's why, you know, like I said, uh, my height, uh, the part of the problem was, you know, jungle roots, the trees come out of the ground quite a bit. It was standing on top of one of them with its its left arm up on 
the uh, or his right arm up on the uh, no, I had it backwards. So it was his his right arm around the tree. Um, I was looking at him forward, so his right arm was up around, the, and then he brought his left arm around the front of the tree to balance himself. And um, that's the only way I saw the claws on the right. Um, I did not see the claws on the left mm. arm. Now, every and it was funny that everybody uh, had a little bit different of the feeding of the feet. Um, when I noticed it was standing, it was the feet were rotated in. Some of the other guys saw that it rotated the feet out and was using the claws on the feet to help balance on the tree. Um, so, so we have, we have yet you another, know, another question in there. Sure. And this is from Sasquatch Wizard Adirondacks. Welcome to Squatch DTV, first of all. And the uh, question is, do they have termite hills in the area? Oh, hills? man, there's... there's uh, you. So what you think of as... You and I think of as termites, it's 17 times bigger down there. And there everything you, everything uh, in the jungle is bigger. Now you yes. see good, good thinking, uh, Sasquatch Wizard. Good yes. thinking because now think about it. They do they let their nails grow out so they can stick them down the. That's a good point. And then, you know, like they the they, the chimps will put sticks down there, but do they? Maybe they're doing that with their claws so they can just. Yeah, it could be, could and be you know uh, there is several plants that are sticky. So do they? My theory, I, I've never seen them do it, but do they wipe their hands on that to make? things stick to them yep. you know like i said the bull ant is about the size of your finger yep. so that's an ant the termites are probably about the same size wow you know so they're i mean like i said everything down there is 500 times bigger than what should be in the united states um including yep. the snakes and everything else yeah now amy boo has a question the men ran away i believe that was the tribesmen had they encountered them before they said hundreds of times because they're always in the, the, the jungle. Yeah, they live there. The Waroni the are considered the guardians of the rainforest uh, by the other tribes. Uh, all the, uh, between the Ashuar, the Shuar, the um, uh, Kofan, the um, uh, Kayapu, uh, which are on the more on the Brazil side, on the uh, Ecuador or the Peruvian side, uh, um, uh, uh, the Yasuni, the uh, Sarayaku, they all consider the Waroni the uh, guardians of the rainforest. Most of, I, most Iwaiwas are are Waroni tribesmen, right. and because they know the jungle like the back of their hand. Yep. Uh, maybe that's why you guys got a roar out of it because you didn't run away. It's probably used to anytime it comes around, everybody runs away from it. <laughs> you guys are just hanging I, around. I, I think I I think I literally froze in the spot. I mean, and now mind you, I was already I'm already experienced combat at this point, and I yeah. still, you know, it's like it it wasn't that type of fear. It was something that it should not be. Right. You know, so you you question what you're seeing. Yes. You question yourself, and for several months, you you and like when we tried to discuss it amongst ourselves, man, we shouldn't be talking about this. You know, yeah. uh, you know. We we called CIA CIA guys spooks, you know. We we were always worried that the spooks would think that we were on drugs, yeah. so that we get kicked out of there. Um, but after a while, um, when we started talking to other villagers and talking to the Achatetas, and they said, "Oh, the, the, they're they're all over down. They're all they're the, they are the true watchers of the rainforest." Mm -hmm. And now, uh, go ahead. Did you ever come across any stories of any other operators running in something similar? Or no, no. no. Everybody no. just kept their mouth shut. Because uh, well, uh, you have to realize that by the time the Clinton administration came into power, the majority of the U.S. operators were out of there. Gotcha. Um, yeah, and the eight we we abandoned. Uh, I'm going to say this, and if anybody from the AUC is watching, we know that we abandoned you. Um, we, we abandoned the AUC and pretty much the cartels were able to fight back, uh, with the FARC and, uh, try to decimate them. And, um, uh, the heat just got too much for most cartels. And so they ended up moving to Mexico because 
mainly because the U.S. does not have a treaty with Mexico where we can operate with firearms in that country. So the Mexican cartels now that have developed from the uh, Medellin, Cali, Cartagena cartels moved to Mexico because they are well protected from being uh, tracked by the DEA and or Border Patrol or any any other U.S. agency without uh, fear uh, because, as you know, that not even a Border Patrol agent can cross the border with his weapon. Uh, yeah. There's no there's no tree where in South America we were there on the invite of both all three governments, Ecuador, Peru, and Colombia, that wanted to do something about stopping narcotic trafficking, especially the yep. uh, the subs uh, building the subs. Yeah, because the sub could really devastate some of those uh, countries' navies because they didn't really have huge ships or anything like that. They had mainly what? Yeah, most of them they they use they use them to transport i mean hundreds and hundreds of pounds right. of cocaine and uh and they couldn't the coast guard couldn't see them because they're under the water line yeah um, cool. yeah i watched a documentary on those too they're, they're okay cool. here 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 i i have a feeling mike is asking this question as kind of a, of a ringer uh oh and uh, the question is, is Ray religious? And if so, how did it play into interpret in interpreting what he oh, saw? Oh, yeah. He's, yeah. He's, 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 he's screwing yes. up. Right? Ah. Yes, yes. Okay, so yes. Um, as I learned from being in South America, um, my particular faith uh, believes that uh, the Inca history is, is quite correct. Um, and that uh, we have a religious book that... Uh, pretty much mimics the uh, uh, Incan history to a T. Um, even the members, uh, even the tribal leaders down there admit that uh, that a, uh, there, there's uh, it's beyond its similarities. It's almost to the T, including the beginning of uh, the Inca Empire. Um, so the, the Yachatetas, which are the the chiefs, religious chiefs of the village, the shamans, um, is the correct, you know, the modern day term. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the Quechua name is Yatateta and the Yatateta, um, they believe that, uh, these are watchers, watchers that were put here by, uh, the sun God Inte, the head God of all gods, and that they are there to, uh, restore the land is someday back to their people. Um, and they truly believe this. And uh, some of the, uh, when we talked to with some of the, uh, this is where it gets a little, you know, you don't know whether it's true or not, but when we talked to some of the, uh, the Catholic Charities workers and said that they had heard these things before and maybe not seen them, but heard them. And but they were known to destroy religious, uh, especially crucifixes. They were known to destroy um, religious items. Um, I don't. I have never seen this. I can't say they did that. And the Achatejas said that wasn't so. In fact, that they, they themselves were part of their religion, and they had a place, much as the Native Americans revered them in a uh, religious sense. So yes, uh, religiously, I have a theory. Um, I believe this is, uh, these are the, uh, I want to say, uh, because I've seen them up in Gwari, I can't say that because I've never seen a Sasquatch, but I would like to believe that I think these are what is mentioned in the book of Enoch. And um, uh, as uh and some sort of seraphim, if you will, uh, that uh, maybe it, maybe it, I, I don't know. Do they have special powers? The, the tribals, the tribal religions down there say absolutely yes. Uh, do they, can they teleport? I, I don't know. I, no one ever has told me that. Um, but, you know, it questions on how fast they move. Is there more than one? Um, 
I know that the one that we had was the same one because it was following us the whole time. We we had evidence that was following us. And I just don't think it knew at first what we were until a lot of the camel wore off and uh, we started really stinking. It smelled like humans and he probably got an idea. Okay, now I know what you are. Um, um, but, but, we, but what you saw was flesh and blood. Oh, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. There, and that one is, it was not, it was not a spirit. It was flesh and blood. Cause like I said, the, the, the thing I remember most when it wrapped its hands around a tree, you could hear and see some of the bark fall off those trees. It's, they're not built like our trees. Um, the bark is loose on some of the types of trees down there. So, and when it, when, when it jumped away, um, it kicked up dirt and everything. And like I said, it bounded. You could actually hear it running through the jungle when it was running until it got far enough away where you couldn't hear it. And that's when it gave its howl. Right. Yeah. So there's, it was physical, very, very physical. But uh, he was able, correct me if I'm wrong though, Ray, he was able to slip up on you guys when you were watching. Specific unheard. 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 No sound. Like better than any Navy SEAL Army Ranger ever could. Yeah. That's, that's not uncommon for its, you know, uh, relatives in the, in the States too. <laughs> that that's what I've been told. Yes, yeah. you know, like I said, I've never. I, I I would just love to find one in the United States and just ask if it's got a brother to South America. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm sure. I mean, yeah. I, I and, and there there's words that um, after speaking, you know, I was there several years after this, and um, um, the problem was is we didn't always see. You know, you everybody said, why didn't you see it again after this? You won't realize that most of the time we were there, we were in firefights. There was right. bullets flying. And that nothing's, nothing is in that area when that happens. Um, could have been there watching me the 22 days I was lost? Absolutely. I would have never known. Yeah. I, I would have never known because they were so stealthy and quiet. I actually had a troop of holler monkeys, and that's why I said it's ingrained in me that just harassed <laughs> the living hell out of me. And uh, I hate those things to the day I die. Um, and, yes, they do fling poo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wonderful. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, somebody had asked earlier, I wonder how they deal with bot flies. I mean, uh, there's. I, I just started... You know, when somebody asks a question like that, sometimes I'll Google it real quick. So sometimes you'll see me why I'm quiet. I'm over here yeah. looking up information. And, yeah, they're, they're, they probably just deal with them like every other primate does. There's, there's been pictures. If you go on there, there's uh, pictures of howler monkeys with lumps on their, their necks. Yes. The, yep. Oh, you know, it's just probably something they're, they get used to after a well, while. Well, yeah, you know, fun. and a lot of that stuff would be removed with grooming. Yes. So. Yeah. We had a pet capuchin monkey, and that's what they would do is uh, he would groom in the areas he couldn't do. Like uh, a another male would come in and pick at it, and, uh, you know, they, they would pull him off. The same with, uh, like, uh, like ticks, yeah. you know, you know or anything else like that. I'm sure they could, you know, handle removing a, oh, yeah. a, a, a bot fly. You know, I mean, you squeeze hard enough, they'll pop like a zit. I mean, it's, yeah. but I mean, it's painful to squeeze them. You got to pull them out as for a human. I don't, I don't know. I'm not a, I'm not a primate. So I don't know how, you know, how, <laughs> what, we're yeah, I mean, well, yeah, we're all primates, but I mean, you know, with the, I don't know whether they, they pull them out with their teeth or, you know, they reach in and grab them. I, I don't know. Oh God. I hate to even think about it. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yep. Lunch. Yeah, that's uh, that's what they do with the grooming, sure. Uh, yeah. So anyway, well, we're we're down to the last five, and Ray, I I want to thank you for coming on tonight. It's been an educational experience as always. Uh, you, you know, we learned more this time around, I think, than we did the first time around, which is yeah, awesome. yeah. yeah. I I I'm just glad that I was able to pull up. Uh, uh, what I'll do is actually I'll, uh, now that uh, I will send you these pictures so that you get a little bit better, um, uh, then you can have them for a resource 
Yeah. Um, I'll send you a copy of the, of the Red Artist rendition. Um, yeah, that'd be awesome. Uh, Rodriguez is her last name. I can't remember her first name, but uh, I think it's, she signed it in the bottom. And you know what um, I'll do is I'll change the thumb to that. Uh, maybe I'll change the thumb to the uh, to the picture, the artist rendition. You know, the yeah. thumb you're looking at now, I'll put that in the circle as opposed to the Oh, that would be cool. The, yeah. yeah. For, for, uh, so that would be awesome. And again, thank you, Ray. And Ray, I hope you, I hope your health's good. I hope your family's doing well. I, I you know, thank you to your 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 uh, kids in in the in the military uh, thank you for their service as well sure thank yeah. you yeah, we're it's all... it's very quiet here in the house now <laughs> I, I wanted to ask ray ray is there any way we can get a hold of that uh, short story that you've written uh... yes i will send you the uh i have a pdf copy of it um i will send it to steve and then steve can disseminate um uh well actually i got your both of your links i'll send it pdf copy of it okay. it is a uh, uh, written journal format um uh, it was printed disseminated up here and uh our church actually disseminated it uh of course i had to change it for their publication but um our church actually put it in one of their short stories in the in our monthly magazine and uh i was told it was uh, 12 million copies were read so wow. um have you yeah, done self publishing that yeah ray come on i've i've been asked to write the full book by military uh military press that covers uh military book club stuff like that um i just it's been one of those difficult things to i i don't mind talking about getting lost because i was just plain idiot um, you know, and, and I look back at it now and it's funnier. Some things are very funny. They want the whole story and telling the whole story is a little bit different. Um, you know, they want from the moment I arrived to the moment I left, um, including being shot, uh, our battles with the FARC and stuff. And that it's, that's something that I'm just not ready to do. But as far as publishing the short story of being lost, um, uh, the guy put it in a book booklet for me. We c circulated it. Um, uh, uh, most of the veteran agencies around here have it. Um, and I do share it online. Um, I never wanted to make a profit off it. I just want people to know the, what the thought process was going on in my head. Well, man, um, put it up on Amazon, man. Let everybody be able to see it. I mean, you know, if if, if you don't charge for it, great. If you charge for it, great. It doesn't matter. Everybody yeah. has to deserve the chance to uh, to read about your adventures or misadventure for this yep. uh, 22 days. Yep. And that, that's the name of the story is 22 days. Wow. So. <laughs> and it, it's sad because there's what? There, there's uh, 22 minutes is the uh, the veteran's. Uh, story. I have a yes. Friend. Yeah. That, oh wow! I just wow. That that just hit me. <laughs> yeah, I just thought because I have a friend who did. A, he he's a uh, he was in the army as well. He got out. His wife's uh, in the military in the in the air force, and uh, uh, they uh, or actually she's in the. Uh, I apologize. She's in the Air National Guard. And he did a, ah. a short movie. Terrible. He did a twenty minute, a twenty two minute movie entitled Twenty Two Minutes, mm -hmm. and it's about a returning vet so no and, kidding and you can tell how that ends because of uh, the title it wasn't a very yeah it's not something you you you're left with a happy feeling with uh yeah, yeah. but but uh yeah so if anybody's uh, wondering what 22 minutes means uh please google that and understand yeah. uh, so anyway um we're gonna shove off here uh thank you again ray Thank you, guys. Thank you. Uh, nice, nice actually seeing you instead of just talking yeah, on the yeah. radio. <laughs> it's awesome. much better. Yeah. And we, and I love this format. We can show things and yeah, you know, where we couldn't do that before. That's why I needed yeah. to get you back on just to. <clears throat> but again, God bless Ray, and you take care of yourself. And Chris, do your thing. Uh, I, once again, I want to thank Ray for coming on. We really enjoyed having you. It's always a pleasure. And uh, thanks to our lovely audience and. Uh, our listeners, we appreciate y'all and these chat room guys and gals have been tickling me to death the whole show. Uh, if this is the first time you watch this on YouTube, 
Uh, <laughs> please hit like, subscribe, or you know, if you don't like it, then hit dislike or whatever. <laughs> and it sharing helps us sharing. Uh, you know, yeah, you, you don't got to send us money or anything. We're just trying to trying to increase the uh, uh, show uh, on the uh, what do they call it that the search engine deal or whatever, yep, yep. so more people can find it. You know, uh, we appreciate it. Yep. So on behalf of everybody here at Squatch DTV, we want to wish everybody a happy, safe, and healthy week. Uh, we Thank you. Will, we will be back next Sunday night. That'll be June 20th, 2021. It'll be Father's Day. And happy Father's Day to you, Ray, a week early. Thank you. <laughs> to you, Chris, a week early. I'll see you Thank next you, week. Anyway. But uh, anyway, uh, folks, be good. We'll catch you all next week, 9 p.m. Eastern, right here on the YouTube. Remember, July 1st, we are going exclusively to YouTube. Catch y'all next week. Hey, folks, you've been watching Squatch DTV. Join us each week, Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, for the latest on the Bigfoot mystery. As always, we thank you for being our loyal viewers and encourage all to subscribe to our YouTube page at youtube.com slash Steve Culls. As always, have a great week. Stay safe. God bless. And keep on squatching.